Hi, once again, um, my name is Andres Ramirez. I am the Vice President of Hispanic Programs for NDN, a uh, think tank and public policy advocacy firm here in Washington, D.C. Um, we, we welcome you guys to our second uh, monthly Latin American Policy Initiative. We kicked this off uh, a couple months ago with Senator uh, Bob Menendez and Ambassador Sarucan from Mexico. Today we're continuing our dialogue on Latin American policy and bilateral relationships between the United States and independent Latin American countries um, with Ecuador. We have joining us today Ambassador Gallegos uh, from the, the Ecuadorian Embassy in the U.S. Um, to talk to us and we also have um, Eric Jacobson here today from Congressman Elliot Engel's office. Um, I want to note that Congressman Elliot Engel uh, was making every attempt to be here today. Unfortunately, he was on a previously scheduled Coldale out in Europe, correct? And um, they had difficulty with the plane and um, he is currently stuck in Ireland uh, trying to make his way back to um, the States. So um, I want to apologize for those of you who are here hoping to hear from Congressman Engel. But Eric Jacobson is a senior foreign policy advisor and has been working on all his policy for Latin America. And he has been gracious enough to stay here and help us uh, with the remarks that uh, Congressman Elliott uh, Engel had prepared to give us today. Um, so just real briefly on format, um, we normally provide for the ambassador to give 10 to 15 minutes of remarks uh, about his views on uh, bilateral relationships between Ecuador and the United States. It is followed by the member of Congress. Today we have filling in for Congressman Engel, as I mentioned, his senior foreign policy advisor, who will give 10 to 15 minute remarks. And then we open it up for questions. Um, the only thing that I will ask for you, as I will be moderating this, is that we will only entertain questions as they are specific towards bilateral relationships between the United States and Ecuador. Our program has been very specific to focus on individual countries. We will be having other events that focus on broader hemispheric relations. I understand there is importance to that as well, but as we do these monthly series, we want them specific towards the countries. Um, so we won't be entertaining questions today about Argentina or Brazil or other issues that are also important to the United States foreign policy, Latin American foreign policy. Today we're going to focus our questions specifically. So when we open it up, if you have questions, please be mindful and respect the program. I, I, I will tell you that we will eventually get to all the Latin American countries. So if there is a country of interest specific to you, we will get to it. And you will have a venue for that eventually. Um, so having said that, I want to go ahead and get started. I know you're not here to listen to me um, and to ramble on about my views on Latin American policy. So I want to ask you to please help me. Again, we normally start with the uh, uh, visiting ambassadors first. So if you can please help me in joining the ambassador, uh, the Ecuadorian ambassador of the United States, Luis Gallegos, I'd really appreciate it. Muchas gracias, Andrés. Es, es un honor estar aquí. Uh, yo tengo que empezar en español. Está bien. Um, I, I, I have to say this in, English, in Spanish because it's my native language. And um, I do think that there is a, an effort so, uh, of, of trying to do it in English. Please excuse my English. Um, I normally begin these issues saying that no, uh, I'm a... A foreign service. I'm a member of the Foreign Service of Ecuador. I'm a, I'm a, I, I have been at this for many time, for, uh, for a long time. Sometimes, looking at your faces, maybe before you were born. Um, I have been a diplomat for, for more than 40 years, and I have, in my reincarnations, been ambassador to different places. But I've learned also that the thinking patterns between me, an Ecuadorian, uh, a lawyer, a Catholic, a uh, which is a, com a commonality between your, uh, Mediterranean Europeans and Latin Americans, is that we deduce. We use fundamentally deductive reasoning, while Anglo-Saxons induce. And many times when we talk about the same things we might agree with, sometimes when we write them, we disagree on them because we come from different venues. Um, that's just a, just a statement of, of beginning with this allocation, because I, I'm here to talk about my country. I'm very honored that, that uh, that uh, Andres Ramirez had invited us for, for the end. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry that Congressman Engel got caught up in Ireland, but if one gets caught up in anywhere, maybe Ireland is one of the best places to get <laughs> caught up. Uh, he uh, he uh, led a Codel to Ecuador uh, uh, a few months back, and we're, we were extremely happy by that initiative. We just had another one in Ecuador last week, f uh, fundamentally visiting the scientific advances in the, in the Galapagos. Um, and we, 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 we keep on uh, trying to, to uh, have a, an, a very ample dialogue 
with different sectors, not only of the United States, but of the world. I, I have 15 minutes, but I, I, I was planning on doing it very, very shortly on, on an introduction between what I believe is, is, is important. I am, like I said, I'm a professional diplomat. When I began this, I was a utopian and an idealist. I really believe that the Charter of the United Nations was the world mandate of, uh, of, uh, of foreign policy and foreign relations. Um, as I have aged, I become more of a realist than maybe a cynic. And therefore, I have, to, I have to agree that interests prevail in foreign policy. And in many cases, those interests conflict, or in many cases, those interests are not the same. And sometimes the best way of getting over this issue is agreeing that we disagree. And sometimes the best way of disagreeing is to know exactly where you're positioned on these issues in order to understand where you're coming from. And also that, the, that politics is an evolving process, an evolving process in which we, <coughs> as diplomats in the United States, look into how your system works in a very, a very detailed way. Um, uh, before going into Ecuador, I would like to explain the challenges for uh, an Ecuadorian ambassador in the United States. Uh, if I were serving in any other country, I would probably go to the, the Ministry of Foreign Relations of France or Italy or uh, Ecuador or Brazil and can hand them in a note and say, extension of ATPDA and SGP is, 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 is valuable for both countries for this reasoning. Uh, when I do that, they tell me, um, when I go to state and say this, and they tell have you talked to the White House? Have you gone up to Congress? Have you lobbied Congress? Have you made your case to the think tanks? How about the media? Have you worked with the NGOs? How about the ecology part? How about the labor part? So, uh, so fundamentally, a diplomat in the United States from a small country like mine meets a gigantic challenge of going up to your House of Representatives and having 435 members of them, but with five or 10 staffers, very knowledgeable, like Eric here, uh, on the issues. Uh, and it is a very challenging issue to try to get to the most of them. Then you have 100 senators with a staff around 100, and then you have the committees. And then you have to convince them that it is valuable for both relations in a multiple dialogue and the reasoning behind the different positions. I had to say that because uh, Ecuador is a small country immersed in, a, in, in, in the world with international relations, not only with the United States, but with more than 100 countries. We have interests in different parts of the world. We have ob obviously uh, traded with many of them, but we also have political interests with others. Ecuador is an oil exporting country. It's been an oil exporting country since 73, and it will continue to be an oil exporting country for the next few decades, until the natural resource, of course, or either you find new resources or you deplete them. But in, uh, in an economy that is $140 a barrel today, and $4 a gallon, we, we think that it might be very possible that the $200 mark might be met someday. We didn't think that five or six years away, and that is, is a major concern to us. How you develop an energy policy, both the consumers and demand, are, are, are one, of our major, one of our major issues. Ecuador has had a prolonged history during the last 30, 30 years of instability. In my personal reasoning, it is due to dictatorship was that there were dictatorships that broke the backbone of institutionalization of democracies in Ecuador and brought in the military to solve the problems. Uh, during the last 10 years, Ecuador has, been, has had presidents of two and a half years each, which has been a very big challenge of stability for the country. And what we're trying to do is normalize and progress into a more permanent venue of institutionalization. Um, when, we, when we talk about these issues, we also talk about what Ecuadorians would wish. Uh, and fundamentally, there is a very big list of what Ecuadorians think, and this is polling fundamentally and, uh, and, 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 and calculations on what, what they want. They want, a, they want stability. They want security. They want, uh, they want to be able to provide for their families and their children with education and health. Ecuador is a 12 million population, half of it is under 19, half of it is under the poverty line. I have to find employment for more than 150 young people every year, or either they go into other, other issues, which is migratory issues fundamentally for Ecuador, because we're the only country in the Andean region that doesn't produce coca and uh, coca leaves, and therefore we are the only zero country in the area that can say that. 
Uh, we have been very successful in doing that, both because of our policing the issue, but also of giving our, our social networks the employment they need for that. Um, Ecuador, during these last years, has looked for a, a way to decrease poverty levels. And that is a very complicated issue because you go into culture, education, and others. And we've had to confront uh, the, the, a conundrum between trade policies that will make you grow and the, the realities, the indigenous realities of the Ecuadorian, of the Ecuadorian farmers. I have a minority in Ecuador, an important minority in Ecuador, which is indigenous. I'll give you an example of that because I think it's valuable in the sense. When I was a young man, many like you, your ages, I, I had a small farm and I wanted to build a, a, I wanted to fix a barn and I asked the foreman who was an Indian to cut the trees and I would be there by Saturdays to cut, to, to cut the trees and build a farm. And when I got there on, on, on Saturday, they, were, they weren't cut. And I was, very I, I was very angry because of that, being young and not knowledgeable about these things. I asked, why didn't you cut them? And he said, that the, the moon. The moon is in the place to cut the trees. So what the moon has to, to do with this thing, come on, you didn't cut the trees and so on. But I asked because I was taught that you had to be very respectful with the culture of indigenous populations because they got this from somewhere. They learned it from somewhere. And this individual who had gone to school for th uh, to the third grade knew this because of oral tradition. He had a culture that knew that the savia of the tree, when you cut it in certain phases, rots before. How do you learn that? Oral tradition, culture. That's the difference between education and culture, between reading Shakespeare and knowing Beethoven and, and having an ingrained culture. And I have many of these groups in Ecuador who believe that uh, transgender, generic uh, seeds or depletion of use of, uh, of insecticides or, 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 uh, or fungicides will, will cause grave damage. And they've been subject to pollution in the Amazon. And they've learned through 500 years of, of exploitation that they need to preserve the earth. So we are dealing with a multiple ethnic society with many ingrained values, with many types of thinking. Because they, are also, they also have another cosmovision. And that is what Ecuador is about. It's a, it's a multi-ethnic, pluralistic country, uh, multi-regional country with different climates that has to look after well, uh, what, it's, what, it, what it is about and how, they vis uh, how the vision of the future will, will act. Fundamentally, uh, uh, when, when you talk about the Ecuadorian process, you're talking about a constant looking for the, the search of truth in a, in a very democratic process. In Ecuador, we have not killed ourselves. In Ecuador, we might disagree, we might topple governments, but we do not have blood on the streets here. We have done this through our mechanisms. Many of them can be criticized by ourselves, but this has been going on in what is a multiple, a multiple issue. Now at the present, um, Mr. Correa, Rafael Correa, the president of, the, uh, of Ecuador, he was, up till three years ago, I would clearly state, a, a college professor. He, is, he was educated in Lovaina, met his wife, is a, married to a Belgium, has three children, did his apostolate in, uh, in, as, uh, in, in the Indian communities of Sumbawa, speaks Quechua, very few Ecuadorians in the middle class speak Quechua, and understand this cosmovision difference between the, Indian, the indigenous. Um, he, he doctored in pure economics from Illinois, so he, he, he can speak French and English, uh, Quechua and Spanish. His, uh, he's a success story. He, when he, probably 30, 30 months ago, nobody knew him. Uh, he became Minister of Finance, and he has become the president of Ecuador with the tremendous backing of the Ecuadorian people who want the change. And that change, as geared by the pro proposal of his party, is a, a constitutional assembly. This constitutional assembly is open to every debate possible. So we have an, an ongoing debate, which will probably end in the sequence in these next few months, and we'll have a constitution which has to be submitted to referendum. Um, most of the people there uh, in, in this constitutional assembly are your age. They are members of academia, they are members of NGOs, they are members of social society. They are not traditional members of the parties. The parties uh, received a, a very bad vote in, 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 the, in the last elections, fundament, fundamentally because persons distrusted them because of the levels of corruption. Those are statistics. I'm repeating what, what the statistics say on, this, on these issues. But what what are we looking for in, 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 in this context? Well, first of all, we're looking for the solution to, a so, to our social problems and the re-engineering of the, of, the, of the state apparatus, the state government, which has entered, which was par uh, partially uh, 
driven by interest in the sense that they were segmented between the parties, and this led to a, a high level of corruption. Efficiency. We're looking for more efficiency in the state held uh, in the, in, uh, of, of the state, and a view that the state has to be responsible for those issues that it should be responsible for giving health, giving education, giving good education and excellence in education, gearing to, gearing to the solution of the, uh, of the problems in the context of a very dynamic world. Because the oil prices, we export oil, but the oil prices at 140 barrels, we import derivatives. We are de derivados, not the derivatives, the derivados, uh, oils and different issues that we do not produce or refine in Ecuador. Uh, we also have a very, a very complex issue in fertilizers and the others, because as they shoot up, the prices of our food are going up. The prices of our food, we, we buy 95% of our wheat outside and we were buying it from the United States. The increase of prices in, in foodstuffs has been very, co very complex because you've changed your, your, corn, your wheat into corn and, uh, and soy to, for ethanol. Uh, uh, plus the natural disasters, which both you have had in Iowa, and I'm very sorry that it was Iowa, I sent a letter to, to Senator Grassley on this issue of the flooding and so on. So we've also had very grave uh, floodings in our coastal region. Climate change is affecting us all and is provoking natural disasters which are, were unprecedented in our areas. All this has aggregated a situation of, uh, of economy. Ecuador has a very solid economy, but then again, you, you have to look at it from a world perspective of where we're going to in the next few, few months or years. We are very knowledgeable about uh, a process in the United States which is an electoral process. You're in a process that will, uh, that will elect a president in, in, in November. That means that you will have another administration probably in February. Whomever wins will have to put that in place. So, so during this year, <coughs> uh, these months, we have to be very careful in opening dialogue with all the partners in order to express our opinions. Sometimes our opinions are not that well transmitted or interpreted by media. And we all are all subject to the, to, to the issues of the interpretation of. Uh, we try to be very frank about our positions, very, very clear about what, what our intentions are. We do not, we are not uh, in, in the position of, of being a, a person who <coughs> tries to do harm to others. We are not in the, in the position of an aggressor. We are fundamentally a peace-loving country. We do not have internal or external conflicts. And we have an agenda that is based fundamentally on the respect for human rights. Um, I myself am um, a member of the UN Committee Against Torture and Cruel and Other Degrading Treatments. I'm one of the 10 world members elected for that. And I also deal in human rights and disabilities to a long extent. Um, when you look at a country, and uh, I would like you to, to look at mine, well, through the eyes of realism for one state, but also in the aspiration that all of us have to have our families and our children in a better place in the world. We have enormous problems that we have to deal with. We hope that we can, uh, we can better the, 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 the situation. But all of these issues are also internationally, <coughs> international, there's an international co-responsibility on this issue. There is an international co-responsibility on everything that is transnational. If you talk about diseases, of course, transnational diseases, HIV and the avian flu will, will be international issues where we need to cooperate. International crime and uh, international crime has three major offsets, drugs, weapons, and trafficking of women. And when I'm talking about trafficking of women and children, this is what we try to avoid. We also try to avoid weapons, weapons merchandising. We do not support that. We're very we're very radical in that. And the drug, and the drug war that is, is an Andean trait has been of enormous consequences to us. We have uh, in our brothers Colombia, a country which we admire and which we respect very much, but the consequences of the internal struggle in Colombia have brought half a million Colombians into Ecuador uh, as migrants, 16,000 in refugee units, and we have something like 40,000 petitions to, be more, to have more refugees. That has an impact on our, on our system. We do not have refugee camps. When the UN Special High Commissioner for Refugees went to Ecuador, he saw that they had integrated into our families, into our villages, into our societies. Uh, Ecuador is the, 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 most, uh, the most important recipient of refugees in, in, in the hemisphere at this point. Problems of international context have to deal with food security now. Where are we, how are we going to get 
food into our tables, which is manageable for especially for the poor. Because when you're talking about an impact in a $5 economy a day of an increase of one fifty or $2, you are, you are condemning people to poverty, but to also to disease. And in some cases, to disability. Ecuador is one case. I, uh, Africa and maybe other countries are worse off, and we have to do our best to try to help them. And we have troops in Africa, and we have troops in, in, in Haiti. And we try to, to be helpful in the concern of peacemaking, but also trying to avoid the conflict areas and helping people come out of their poverty, even if we are in a situation of, of that nature. Um, I would like to go into two more aspects fundamentally, and this is a vision of the future. I think that we have an ongoing dialogue with the United States, which is a very fruitful dialogue. We, we sit down and we discuss those issues in the ample sense of the word, which are, uh, are issues of concern to us in, the, in, in a very multi and multifaceted relationship with the United States, because the United States and us have a multidimensional contact, from education to industry to trade to, to, to health. All these issues interact between each other. And of course, that has a certain level of what other critics say is determinism. We are determined by the problems. And I think that is not reality. Reality is that we should look for the solution of those problems that determine a conduct in order to understand how it, how it works and how it functions, in order to find a, a, a mutually agreeable solution. Maybe we'll agree to disagree, which is also a possibility amongst human beings. And what we ask for is mutual respect between us and understanding of where we are in our process of democracy with the respect to other processes of democracy. Um, the theories of capacity and success of this, uh, of this uh, enterprise are marked by the capacity of the Ecuadorian people to be able to change and have a more holistic and integral society. We are a pluralistic society that has to make significant changes in the way we context the issues of differences in racial origins and problems of poverty in different scales. Uh, with the United States, I have, of course, a long gamma of of issues. I will only touch on one of them, which is migration. I have talked to you, the leaders of Congress, both in the Senate and in the House, on what I feel is a very complicated issue for us and for the, the, the Hispanic minority in, in the United States. When I, when I came to school here, nobody would stop another person in the street because it was illegal, because he looked like an Andean Indian or an Ecuadorian because he, he, he was perceived as being a criminal because he was undocumented. This is a migrant country which has built its resources on that, and there are millions contributing to its economy, which most Americans understand. But as you age as a society, as the baby boomers age, you will need more help. And maybe it's better to have people from the same hemisphere and region doing that, not to get into the partialization of legal aspects. Here you, you fail to have a federal federal legislation, which I'm not saying is the best, but you failed to do it last year. And now I'm having a plethora of legislation by cities, by counties, by, by states, which are fundamentally xenophobic and are persecuting migrants that are, that are documented or undocumented. So I have cases every day on, in my desk of ill treatment and violation of human rights, which you call civil liberties here. So I would like to call your attention that this needs to be solved in some way and you, it may be a debate in the, in the presidential election, but something has to be done in order to solve these problems. Something has to be done to have a more equitable relation of trade, a more beneficial mutual relationship. I cannot retool my Indian population to grow corn as your companies in the Middle East, in the, in the, in the Middle West are growing corn. Those are gigantic conglomerates that are doing that. The small farmers of the United States have disappeared from when I, when I was counsel in, in Illinois some 30 years back. But my people cannot compete with subsidies that between you and the Europeans and Japan are $1.2 billion a day, a day. I could probably pay my foreign debt in eight days with what you're subsidizing your agricultural sector. So it makes it very difficult for me to sit down in front of another and say, free trade, and, and subsidy, no, we'll, we'll talk about that later. You have to comply with this. And this is the great dilemma of, the, uh, uh, of Doha and the, and, and the incapacity of arriving at, at a solution. But I'm talking about food for my people. And I'm talking about 
a change in, in societies and cultures would sometimes make it more difficult for certain, certain societies than others. Um, I'll stop there. I, I'll be open to any question. There are many others, of course, and uh, we try to be the most frank I can in, 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 in answering them. Uh, but I'd like to leave on a, on, on a positive issue that we have problems and we have to look for solutions for the problems. That's the whole, that's the whole nature of, of a mutual open dialogue. And I think that that part we have with the United States, we have with the United States political establishment, we have it with your Congress, and we're trying to do the best we can in getting our message across with all the limitations a small embassy of five has in Washington. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we are saving questions for the end of the program, so we're going to give Eric an opportunity to go ahead and um, uh, give us remarks on behalf of Congressman Engel. I do know there are a couple of open seats, so if anybody from the audience is looking to sit down, please go ahead and grab your seat. And I'm also going to look to see if we can raise the temperature on this yes. AC. Uh, thank you very much, Andres. Uh, I know that Congressman Engel really uh, wanted to be here today, especially when he heard that um, he'd be sharing the stage with his good friend, Ambassador Gallegos. And in fact, as Congressman Engel often says to Ambassador Gallegos, um, um, it was because of the meeting uh, that the two of them had that Congressman Engel went to Ecuador in the first place um, because it was kind of invitation to travel down to Ecuador. Um, let me start by giving you a brief readout of Congressman Engel's trip to Ecuador in February, which I joined him for. And then maybe at the end I can talk a bit about the uh, March 1st Andean border crisis uh, since a great deal has happened since our trip down there. Um, the trip was around February 18th or so, and then about 12 days later the Andean border crisis emerged. Uh, so there's a lot that's happened since then. Um, Congressman Engel traveled to Ecuador, Bolivia, and Argentina in February. And he chose these three countries because they're all countries that, um, to some degree or another, have had tension in their relations with the United States over the past couple of years. Uh, particularly in the case of Ecuador, um, my boss feels that there's a lot more that unites the, our two countries and divides us. And as he said in his meetings with the presidents of each of the three countries, um, from his perspective, he feels it's important for members of Congress to travel and let foreign leaders know that in the U.S., Congress is a co-equal branch um, that also has an important foreign policy role. Um, in terms of Ecuador, I um, just wanted to talk a bit about his meeting with President Correa. Um, Congressman Engel came away from this meeting convinced that President Correa is someone with whom the U.S. can and should work closely, in spite of what you know, we often hear up here. Um, Correa, as my boss constantly says, he was educated in the United States, and in our meeting with him, it really came through that he has a great deal of fondness for our country, and, and really wants to find opportunities also to work together, even when there are disagreements between our countries. Uh, one such disagreement which uh, came up in the course of our meetings down there, of course, um, and one which many of you know about, is the renewal of the agreement for the um, U.S.-run uh, Monte base in Ecuador. Um, as you might know, it's, it's the forward oper operating location or Monte base um, in northern Ecuador. And um, the Monte base and our, our joint counter-narcotics efforts in Ecuador have really been a success story over the years. And, you know, my boss and, and many of his colleagues would definitely like to see the base continue operating. But that said, um, he also respects Ecuador's sovereignty and President Correa's wishes to have the U.S. leave after the lease agreement expires. And he really wants to work with the president, and they discuss this, to find additional ways to cooperate on counter-narcotics, even without the Monte base. Um, you know, the Monte base, obviously, as, as many of you might know, it's not actually a U.S. base, but it's a forward operating location there. And so there's a U.S. presence there. And, and as we understand, it still will continue some of the counter-narcotics work. Uh, let me talk a bit about the, um, the Andean Trade Preference and Drug Eradication Act, or ATPDA. Uh, which the ambassador touched on, because that was one of the main focuses on our trip, of our trip. Uh, my boss is one of the leading advocates for a long-term renewal of ATPD Day for all four Andean countries. So that's Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. And um, in the case of Peru, um, it soon will not need the preferences when, when their free trade agreement is fully implemented at the end of this year. Um, you know, from the perspective of my boss, um, short-term extensions um, are a good start. Um, but he feels that a short-term extension of, of the Andean trade preferences just does not promote the kind of uh, stable investment climate that businesses need for long-term economic growth and, and job creation um, in the Andean region. Um, ATPDA, as many of you know, has been a real successful uh, success story. Um, it's created hundreds of thousands of jobs in the Andean region, and at the same time, it, it fulfills a lot of U.S. geopolitical goals. Um, in Ecuador, um, our delegation, 
visited with producers of flowers, uh, broccoli, coffee, cacao, and other products. Um, without the extension of ATPDA, it was made quite clear to us that these jobs, um, which are in sectors that don't directly compete with U.S. jobs, um, would quite simply be eliminated. And the argument has always gone that some workers um, will lose their jobs um, and then turn to the illegal drug trade. And this is definitely true. And, and the ambassador talked about the zero coca policy um, in Ecuador. Um, while there's no doubt that this is true on the drug front, um, one of the things that, that Congressman Engel and the delegation learned is in their visit to Ecuador is that a failure to extend the anti trade preferences would also likely cause many of these workers to illegally immigrate to the United States. And I just wanted to read an excerpt from a letter that uh, Congressman Engel wrote to the New York Times following his visit to Ecuador. Um, he wrote that, quote, those who worry about illegal immigration should embrace the Andean trade preferences, which help keep the citizens of the Andean region in sustainable jobs in their home countries, end quote. Um, the week after our trip, Congress extended the Andean trade preferences for 10 months. And um, that takes us here to the end of December. So, you know, Mr. Engel personally had hoped for a longer term extension, but was happy to get 10 months for the four Andean countries, which was a little bit longer than the previous extension of eight months. So this seems like we're on the right path. But again, in the past, the extensions have been five years, two years. So <laughs> relatively speaking, these are short-term extensions. And in terms of thinking about um, a long-term investment climate, uh, thinking about the stability of jobs in the Andean region, long-term extensions um, are more helpful in that front. Um, final thing uh, on the trip. Um, uh, we met with uh, USAID beneficiaries, Peace Corps volunteers, um, projects um, with the Inter-American Foundation. And in all three instances, um, Congressman Engel and all the members of the delegation were really impressed by the good work being done on a day-to-day -day basis by the United States and Ecuador, something that we probably don't think about or, or know about um, these individual projects in a small country, but that really make a huge impact. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that, that our delegation left um, Ecuador on February 18th which was 12 days before the Andean border conflict between Ecuador and Colombia, uh, which took place on March 1st. In terms of the crisis itself, um, Mr. Engel held a hearing on this matter, and he really believes that there, there are equities on both sides, and that neither side is completely right and neither side is completely wrong. Um, and he was impressed by the excellent job that uh, the Secretary General of the, the OAS, the Organization of American States, um, Jose Miguel and Sulsa, and the OAS member states did in working to resolve the crisis. Um, as well as what President Leonel Fernandez from the Dominican Republic did um, in a meeting of the Rio group in the Dominican Republic. Um, but I do want to point out one of his frustrations uh, regarding the U.S. reaction to the border crisis, and this is nothing new, it's something that he's expressed in public hearings. Um, as you know, shortly after the tensions began to flare up between Colombia and Ecuador, uh, President Bush reached out to Colombian President Alvaro Uribe, which Congressman Engel feels is perfectly appropriate. And let me say that he's visited uh, Colombia twice. He thinks that President Uribe does, has done an incredibly impressive job uh, in Colombia and really turning things around and reducing uh, homicides, kidnappings, massacres, really bring down these key indicators. Uh, from his perspective, however, he was disappointed that uh, President Bush failed to reach out directly and personally um, to Ecuadorian uh, President Correa. Um, you know, what most concerns him is that this could, in some ways, and maybe it has, it really remains to be seen, but cause some sort of degradation in, in relations between Ecuador and the United States um, as a result of the border crisis. And like I said, you know, he feels that, that both Ecuador and Colombia are key U.S. allies, extremely important, um, but specifically um, in the Ecuador instance, he feels that uh, we should have done more to, to reach out on that front. I just wanted to read a quote from the hearing that we held on this that sort of expressed his his views regarding President Correa and this, this situation, and uh, some of what I touched on at the beginning and also the border crisis. Um, Congressman Engel said that, um, he said, you know, I met for over an hour, probably about an hour and a half with President Correa. I was impressed with President Correa. I know there have been some differences of opinion between some of the administration with Correa, but I personally think that we make a big mistake if we push him off and push him away and assume he's in cahoots with Chavez. I think we make a very, very big mistake. He's American educated. I know that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but I think what it means is that he's aware of our country and aware of our culture and what we stand for. He conveyed to me and the other members of my congressional delegation that he wanted to have good relations with the United States and he wanted to work with us. So I think that's you know, really how he feels. He feels that there's a lot that can be gained uh, between a positive relationship with, between Ecuador and the United States. And that was really a, a sentiment that was shared uh, by all the members of his congressional delegation. It was a bipartisan delegation. And, um, that's sort of how he's feeling moving ahead. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Eric, very much. Um, just a quick um, comment through, uh, on my end. I just want to let everybody know that this uh, forum will be, uh, is being videotaped by NDN, and we will have it up on our website and our YouTube channel uh, once it's fully processed for people who want to view it or uh, get more information if they missed some portions of the event. Um, at a later point in time. Also, we are working with uh, folks over at the Georgetown Center for Latin American Studies um, that we're trying to get them to help us develop as well uh, policy papers on helping to determine, based on our forums, how we can provide guidance on improving relations between the United States and the various hemispheric countries in Latin America. Um, having said that, I do want to open up the uh, um, floor for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please stand up, identify yourself, and I'll make sure that we uh, have it on our, on our video. Thanks. Questions? More questions, we're lucky. You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yes, question up here. Uh, Ambassador, how do you feel that the United States, besides removing agricultural subsidies, can best facilitate uh, your battle against poverty in the country? Well, I, do I? Oh, oh, we'll much better. This. Thank you very much. We, we'll share the, the, the microphone. Okay. Um, I, I have to say that poverty is one of the most structurally complicated issues in, in, in my country and in the world. How you change the, 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 the issue of I mean, poverty ingrained uh, subsistence type of agriculture, or how you change the way of thinking about poverty and this vicious circle of not being able to get beyond that. It's something that we need to do, all of us, together. The opportunity of opening, of course, production and trade is one way, but it's not the only way. You have to create the infrastructure, the education, the knowledge, the incentive to do that. Uh, the, the way to do it is also to have a change in how, what the visions of the, uh, uh, of, of, of the population is in relation to, to, to development. When we talk about sustainable development, we're talking about sustainable development that doesn't deplete the jungles and leave an Indian community abandoned for the rest of its life and in sickness, uh, which is a case which I have in Ecuador. I'm not talking about theoretically, I have. I have development and petroleum development has brought to many of my communities tremendous, tremendous ill. Uh, so I do think that we have to be, have a composition of, of the measures of dealing with poverty that did not absolutely eliminate the possibility of sustainable development and uh, human development as, uh, as defined by the United Nations on uh, a democratic participation in, 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 in decision making, the, the issue of having all the elements of health and education to do this. If you do not have that, you cannot, you, you, you're simply not going to get there. Yeah, uh, Nico Martinez with the uh, Senate Majority Leader. Uh, Eric mentioned sort of uh, the congressman's feelings about the U.S. reaction to the border crisis. And I was interested to hear what uh, the ambassador's perspective was on, on the U.S. response. Um, fine, thank you. I, uh, this is a very complicated issue for us. Uh, it has been a complicated issue for us. Uh, Undoubtedly, one of, the, one of the problems we have with this is being solved as we talk because we're reestablishing relations according to, to an intervention by President Carter, really. For the, uh, President Carter intervened a couple of weeks ago, and uh, from the public announcements from world countries, we'll have uh, diplomatic relations reestablished by next week. Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is that that is a very complicated problem. Uh, first of all, because we, we are a country which cannot accept the violation of our sovereignty, certainly the United States wouldn't accept it, uh, in, in an attack on our, uh, in, on our country without previous consent. When we understood this, and this is what was conveyed to President Correa by President Uribe, was it was hot pursuit, <coughs> and uh, we don't have problems with hot pursuit. But a, an attack as the way it was developed, uh, what Ecuador did was take it to the OAS and follow the procedure of, uh, of the charter of the OAS to look for a solution, and that's what we've done. Uh, the, the meeting in, of the Rio group in, in, in Santo Domingo and the uh, intervention of the presidents there took it to a new level of solution. Um, but let me, let me uh, reframe this issue. Okay. I am a country that feels the effect of an, an issue 
that is fundamentally illegal, which is the production of narcotics. These narcotics are neither consumed nor produced by my, my country. They are consumed by the United States, which consumes around 400 tons a year. Out of Colombia, or uh, this is according to your statistics, approximately a thousand tons of cocaine are coming out to different parts of the world. So if you don't fix your social system and eliminate the consumption of 25 million Americans of cocaine, there will be no solution to this problem. This is co-responsibility to the highest levels. I know that normally this is very harsh to say. My PR firms say, don't say this, you know, because Americans believe that all of them are white hats, and this is not a problem. This is a problem where while you have the demand, if you have the demand, whatever place you put the blockages you put will not, will not solve the problem of consumption. And that is a reality. So I think we should sit down and look into this problem and say, okay, you capture the capos in the United States, not only in other parts of the world. I, I captured guerrilla leaders and the, the, the highest level of guerrilla leaders that Ecuador captured was Simon Trinidad, and he, and, and he was handed over to the, to the Colombians and the Colombians handed over to the Americans. So we've been more than a trusty ally in this because we guard our frontier with 12,000, 10,000 men, <coughs> both policemen and army, to control a frontier because on the other side, we have problems. And then we spend $140 million or more keeping armed troops there, and what we get for, for, for aid in that is curtailed to the level of $7 million and gets to something like $40 million a year. So, you know, this is a combination of what we have to do. But it is a social problem in the United States and other parts of the world. The Europeans are not exempt from this. They consume 250 tons. The Brazilians and the Japanese and the others also consume this. Uh, from my personal perspective, I don't think you're going to get over an issue of, 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 of being able to, to control these illegal groups unless you stop consuming. And there we have to sit down and see what we can do in the United what you're, you're doing in the United States to stop, to stop the use of alkaloids. Yes, question? Uh, Jeffrey Brook, Catholic News Service. Um, <coughs> First of all, you mentioned climate change and the Galapagos Islands, and you know the Galapagos are obviously a treasure, you know, for the, for the world. They're a beautiful place. I haven't visited them myself. Um, and but my question is, what is Ecuador doing uh, within the country, and then also with the United States, to try and solve some of these issues regarding climate change? And that is a very big question, my friend Jerry Jeffrey. Um, the Galapagos Islands are a treasure, a patrimony of humanity, a heritage of humanity, by, by qualified by UNESCO. And I think Ecuador is a, a star player in the world of having that, that national reserve and park. It is in itself a demonstration. You know, we receive hundreds of scientists that go there and administrators that go and see how we manage the park or how we do this. But that does not mean that we don't have human problems of migration toward the islands because the level of uh, standards of living in the islands are higher than the continent. Uh, it doesn't mean we have, uh, we don't have problems. We have uh, a problem of invasive species that were brought in there early last century and we're trying to get, we avoid them. These are projects that cost 15, 20 million dollars and we do this with, uh, with NGOs, with environmental groups, with governments. Uh, but on the issue of climate change, uh, and not to go into the Kyoto Protocol because that would go, would, after the last comment I would also get into more trouble. Um, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the issue of oxygen and the issue of how the world is looking at the problem of, uh, of, of environmental depletion and climate change, there has to be a mechanic in where we have to do what I just said a few minutes. Look at a solution, a viable solution, an important solution to this because what we're doing fundamentally is, not, is, is, is avoiding what is coming up. And when you see the natural disasters, the level of the natural disasters that, that, are, that are happening in the world, it, it is very complex. I am a frontline country with Peru and parts of Colombia for the phenomenon of, of El Nino. That means that the effect of El Nino hits us, and it used to do it every seven years. And we knew we, we had this. We had this uh, calculated. And it, in these last decades, they have been every five years, and they're reducing the phenomenon to every four years because of climate change. 
That means that while it's, you know, it's raining and, and, and flooding in my area, in, the, in Australia they don't have water for, the, for, for anything. So this is the impact which we have to look at in a very complex way. But you know, the United States has to be able to control the climate deterioration that it produces in the general atmosphere. And we can contribute to that because what we do is put oxygen in the world. What we do is we're natural jungles. We have the capabilities of trading this in, in carbon futures. Uh, Ecuador is extremely conscious of its nature. It's, pro it's, it's proposed a project which uh, to many might feel utopian. We've said, look, we have this plot of petroleum in the, in the middle of a national park which is one of the biggest reserves we have, or the, high, or the biggest reserve uh, of petroleum we have. We are not going to exploit it if we can get contributions, and we'll pay half of that. If we were going to get seven mil 700 million a year, we'll pay 350 million if someone and the rest of the world will help us keep that petroleum underground for the benefit of the jungles, but also for the benefit of non-contact people that live in that, in that national park. It's an extraordinary initiative. Uh, I think that it, it, it merits consideration by the rest that there are changes. And when you talk about not uh, drilling in national parks or not drilling offshore, what you're doing is something that we're doing also in trying to control the deterioration of climate. Uh, but we, the effects of climate are felt by us very strong. That's actually going to be the last question. So, go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador, for your um comments. Um, you mentioned human trafficking, and perhaps the demand is from overseas, but what is Ecuador doing uh, to prevent these people from maybe taking these uh, children and women to other countries? Um, I came to Washington approximately two years and a half ago, and uh, we have uh, we, we, have, we had a problem of, of, of being in tier two of the trafficking issue. And uh, when I asked why we were in that category, the answer was because of these the changes in government had not established a system that worked on, on, on the issue of persecution and impunity of this thing. Uh, so with the government of Alfredo Palacio and the government of Mr. Correa, we have established a very radical, a ra very radical program in which we have taken people to jail. We have, we have done this. Trafficking is, is, is very difficult to control, especially in, in areas of frontier where you have conflicts on the other side. Uh, but I think Ecuador, because of the dimensions and because of the number, it, it's not that important in the sense of quantity. It is important because, it, in essence, if you have one person who is trafficked, one woman or child who is trafficked, uh, and where are they trafficked preferentially? They're trafficking to brothels in Europe and the United States. So when, when you look at trafficking, you look at other dimensions. I'll give you an example of this. I won't mention the country because it, it would be completely undiplomatic of me, more than I have been in this. In the, in this. Um, I sit on the, on, 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 on the committee that monitors countries uh, for torture, cruel, degrading treatments, and one of them <coughs> is, is trafficking. And I know of cases of countries that have one million women being trafficked in the, in the world. While you do not, while we cannot control the drug trafficking and the weapon trafficking, women are a subsidiary product of this issue. If you break the backbone of this trafficking, uh, this illegal issue, you, you, you will break the backbone of trafficking, uh, which is a continuation of the, elite, uh, of the illegal conduct of, uh, of, of these people. And I know for a fact that if we can have women protected, and we can have refugee, refuge houses for women, which we have established, and numbers to call, and conscious, consciousness building of the society on what we're talking about, we will be very successful in this. And I think we're doing very, we're, we have a concrete program. So much so that Ambassador Linda Jewell, who was the ambassador of the United States to, uh, to Ecuador, was awarded the prize for trafficking last year in the work the embassy had done there. Uh, the ex-first lady of, the, of, of Ecuador, Maria, uh, Maria Palacio, was awarded the heroin award for the work against trafficking. And I think that Ecuador has obtained from USAID with Cambodia the, the two pilot projects to do this, 
and be able to demonstrate to others that it can be done. So uh, I will not be satisfied until we don't have anyone in that trafficking. But we are advancing in this sense. Uh, once again, I want to thank you guys all very much for coming here. Uh, if we can get another round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> An ambassador and all of that may not be the best PR advice. You, I appreciate the candor. I think it's a, a, a breath of fresh air for us at NDN who want to have a frank discussion of where we can move forward. And so it's good sometimes to take the PR people out of the room and allow people to have frank, honest discussions. So I really appreciate that. Again, I just want to emphasize that the, um, the forum will be put on YouTube um, yeah, shortly on our website for those of you who would like to watch it if you miss any portion of it. And then also we look forward to working with the Embassy of Ecuador so we can follow up and figure out how we can draft recommendations on improving some of these issues that were highlighted today. So thank you guys all very much for coming and um, we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you very much.